أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته وعونه ودعاءه وخيره ورضاه ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pray that you are all in the best of health and reaping the incredible benefits and spiritual reinforcements of this holy month of Ramadan. May Allah grant you greater proximity to Him, uh, insha'Allah. So we've been discussing family ethics. In particular, some of the questions that we raised in the previous session was, what is the purpose of the family? Why is the family such an important bedrock of society? How do other philosophies view the family? There are, as we've demonstrated, some concerted efforts to undermine the veracity and strength of the family. The family as a unit that gives rise to communities and societies and civilizations is now seen only as an economic unit, as a means of uh, providing and contributing to the economy and nothing more. This, of course, is extremely problematic. And as we've said in the previous session, it aims to destroy civilization as we know it. It aims to completely break down divine ethics and morality. And of course, it goes without saying that the first place that must be targeted in order to achieve that goal is the family. Once you're able to infiltrate this close-knit community of a father, a mother, and children, once you're able to undermine this institution, you have successfully begun the process of completely dismantling divine morality, which is why many have been completely unapologetic about their aims and objectives in this regard. I quoted uh, Karl Marx, as well as modern philosophical reincarnations of Marxist ideology on how they find the family to be uh, an obstacle in their way, how they uh, feel that the family produces uh, the kind of environment that is antithetical to what they're trying to achieve. And yet, when you look at the Holy Qur'an, when you look at Islamic scripture, when you look at the Hadith corpus, the words and traditions of the Holy Messenger of God and his immaculate household and successors, you find a completely different picture. You find the family uh, being uh, awarded the highest position in the hierarchy within society. You find the Holy Prophet, as I quoted him in the previous session, saying that there is no greater institution in the entirety 
of the religion of Islam that is more beloved to, to God than the family. And this emphasis is something that we find highlighted over and over again within our Quranic and Hadith corpus. And I want to draw your attention to uh, some of those references uh, in this session as we try to explore the uh, central position of the family within the religion of Islam, within God's final revelation, and how that contrasts with neoliberal philosophy and other uh, prevalent ideologies of the day. For instance, look at this verse in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ I'll get to uh, the exegesis of this verse and the meaning of these incredibly insightful words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in just a little bit. But before that, um, neoliberal philosophy, as I've said earlier, is now the dominant worldview. Militant feminism and trans activism has brought us to where we are today. A society that's simultaneously obsessed with and deprived of intimacy, almost exhausted to that level. Families that are so dysfunctional and inept that the idea of tranquility that the Quran talks about can only be found in inebriation through alcohol, cannabis, or other drugs. It is tranquility through tranquilizers, ironically, not through spiritual growth. From Euclidean philosophers to Freudian psychologists, the prevailing culture that governs how the world thinks today is centered around maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, not finding peace by connecting to the Creator. And this is at the very core of the problem. Women who were right up until the 19th century seen as properties of men because they're seen as less than human, obviously, are now encouraged to rebel against everything, including their own gender. The family is but an economic unit and paid work is all that counts. Any kind of work that is unpaid is completely worthless and abhorred. Equality means that women should be wage earners. They should go out and work and make the dough, as they say, even if it means being put in a position where they get sexually harassed every single day at the workplace. Governments provide daycare centers and support so women get out and work, where being a housewife is a vulgar profanity, so much so that even Muslim women feel ashamed of the term now. So we're back where we started, at least in the neoliberal world, unless you're a doctor or a pharmacist or some other type of tax-paying subject of the almighty corporations, you're less than human and don't deserve any respect. So dehumanizing is this reality of women that even in liberal democracies like the United States, like the UK, women are now rebelling against it. The concept of trad wives, look it up, it's a thing. That concept, trad meaning traditional, is gaining traction where women aspire to some idealistic 1950s and 60s concept of the housewife, a woman who looks after what's inside the house, providing care and compassion for her family, while the husband is obligated to provide for literally everything else. Like, uh, you know, things like cooking uh, the food and greeting the husband at the door. I mean, these are things that they talk about greeting the husband at the door and cleaning and so forth. These are not seen as, oh my God, how dare you confine me to the kitchen, but I shouldn't have to worry about the mortgage or the endless barrage of utility bills and the house and the thousand other um, uh, uh, you know, issues and, and bills and financial things that, uh, that I am forced to care about and to contribute towards. These are the actual words of these women. And these are not Muslim. These are women who live in, you know, 
liberal democracies where the welfare state is alive and well, where the government uh, ensures that labor rights and so forth are, you know, relatively maintained. And yet in these societies, these particular women are saying that this reality of ours today is antithetical to being a woman. This is antithetical to the nature of women. As the commander of the faithful so beautifully says in a famous hadith, he says that المرأة ريحانة ليست بقهرمانة قهرمان is not an Arabic word. It's actually derived from Persian. And in Persian, it means a knight. It means someone with um, uh, not just authority, uh, but also someone who is rough, someone who is, um, you know, has military capabilities and so forth. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, that a woman is like a flower. She's like a tender um, plant. She's not a knight. And so she should be treated as such with delicacy, with compassion, with love, right? That's how a woman is supposed to be treated, not ad, a, as just another cog in the wheel, as we said earlier. And so a lot of these women who are not Muslim are waking up to this reality and saying, hang on a second, why am I? expected to contribute towards the mortgage. Why do I have to go out, go out and work and answer to God knows how many bosses and whatnot just because all in the name of equality? What kind of equality is this? Where I'm forced into something that I'm not comfortable in. And conversely, a quick glance at Islamic scripture, whether it's the Holy Quran, or our rich hadith corpus reveals something entirely different. The sanctified station of the family is uh, front and center when you look at our traditions, for instance. The family, as we said, is the building block of society. It's the bedrock of a good moral civilization and it should be treated as such. I'll mention a few hadiths, and we'll go through them, inshallah, as we seek to receive illumination and inspiration from the words of our divinely appointed leaders. These are people who aren't just mere role models, as we sometimes refer to them. The Holy Prophet and his Immaculate Household are our leaders. Whatever they say is divine inspiration. What they convey to us are the words of God. And so when you look at their traditions, when you look at what they've said, you find a completely different reality. So we'll go through some of these traditions and we'll make commentary along the way, inshallah. The first one is in the blessed book of Al-Kafi, Al-Sharif. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam uh, narrates from the Holy Messenger of God. He says, مَسْتَفَادَ مْرِئٌ مُسْلِمٌ No Muslim has gained a benefit greater than مَسْتَفَادَ مْرِئٌ مُسْلِمٌ فَائِدَةً بَعْدَ الْإِسْلَامِ أَفْضَلْ مِنْ زَوْجَةٍ مُسْلِمَةٍ تُسِرُّهُ إِذَا نَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا Look at how the role of marriage as the first step towards building a family is uh, sanctified to an almost unbelievable and inconceivable station. The Prophet says that in Islam, no one is a greater winner than one who finds a good, loving, compassionate spouse. مِنْ زَوْجَةٍ مُسْلِمَةٍ تُسِرُّهُ إِذَا نَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا A good wife who brings him joy when he looks at her. He seeks delight whenever he sees her. Which is, again, mind-boggling to think about all the things that the Prophet could have mentioned as being the greatest things, right? The, the greatest achievements of a Muslim. 
And yet the Prophet says, this is the greatest achievement. Look at this other hadith. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam reports from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi who narrates from God. In other words, this is hadith Qudsi. قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِذَا أَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَجْمَعَ لِلْمُسْلِمِ خَيْرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if I wanted to give someone the best of this world and the next, what do you think God would give him? Obviously, you might say things like faith and so forth, and that's a given, no doubt. You have to have faith before any of these things begin to make sense and, and matter and provide purpose to your life. But other than that, what is it? Is it health? Is it wealth? Is it having a lot of good friends? What is it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا أَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَجْمَعَ لِلْمُسْلِمِ خَيْرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ جَعَلْتُ لَهُ قَلْبًا خَاشِعًا I would give him a heart that fears, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلِسَانًا ذَاكِرًا And a tongue that is in constant remembrance of Allah. وَجَسَدًا عَلَى الْبَلَاءِ صَابِرًا And a body that uh, is patient in adverse conditions when trials and tribulations hit him. وَزَوْجَةً مُؤْمِنَةً تُسِرُّهُ إِذَا نَظَرَ إِلَيْهَا and a good believing wife who brings him joy and delight whenever he looks at her. And who uh, protects herself and protects him whenever he's away, she remains uh, chaste and pure. Also in the blessed book of Al-Kafi, uh, where it is reported from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, who mentions a, an incident, he says, جاء رجل إلى أبي A man came to my father, meaning Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam. And he said to him, meaning Imam al-Baqir said to this man, هل لك من زوجة? Do you have a wife? قال لا. The man said, no, I don't. So my father said to that man, ما أحب أن لي الدنيا وما فيها. I don't wish that I had this entire world and everything that's in it. وَإِنِّي بِتُّ لَيْلَةً وَلَيْسَتْ لِيَ زَوْجَةً In exchange, if I get the entire world, all the money, all the wealth, all the everything, if I was given that and told that you have to spend one night without a wife, one night without a spouse, I would, pr I would choose having a spouse uh, and not being given the entire world. ثُمَّ قَالْ Then the Imam said, and this by the way applies to both men and women, ثم قال الركعتان يصليهما رجل متزوج two units of prayer two cycles ركعتان يصليهما a man who's married أفضل من رجل أعزب is better than a, a single person يقوم ليله ويصوم نهاره who spends the entirety of the night in prayer and the day in fasting ثم أعطاه أبي سبعة دنانير ثم قال تزوج بهذه. Then Imam al-Baqir gave that man seven dinars, seven gold coins, and he said to him, go and get married using this money that I gave you. In other words, notice how Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam tells us not about the physical benefits of prayer because those are obvious. He talks about the spiritual benefits of salat, uh, of marriage. He talks about the uh, how uh, marriage allows us to seek proximity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have that journey boosted by means of uh, having that companionship uh, alongside us. And then the Imam isn't content with merely speaking about the virtues and benefits of marriage. Rather, he helps facilitate this person's marriage, which is a lesson for all of us who are already married and who are perhaps more fortunate than others and who have the kind of wealth where we can help even, uh, you know, albeit in small amounts, those people that are struggling and those who find it difficult to get married for financial reasons. The Imam gave him 
that money and he said, now go and get married. You have no excuse anymore. All you need to do now is find someone who is willing to marry you. And so again, as I said, there's a lesson in this particular hadith and many others like it uh, for all of us where, and this is something that uh, a lot of scholars have advocated for, something that I've talked about previously, where, uh, uh, you know, the idea is for us to set up a fund. Every community in every city should have a fund where they collect money, whether it be through uh, loans or donations, where these funds would be collected together and then given to those who are trying to get married but cannot afford to do so. Um, again, either as a donation, a gift, or as an interest-free loan. Obviously, it would have to be interest-free, otherwise it would be haram, but, uh, but to help encourage them. And so, uh, because I've seen people, um, perhaps we have less of these individuals in the West than we do in uh, less um, economically developed countries, but I've seen people who say that financially, I'm just not able to make ends meet, I need to rent uh, a house, uh, particularly if the, if the individual is younger, who is fresh out of high school or college or what have you, obviously for them to uh, rent a, an apartment, to get a car, for instance, and so forth, would be uh, prohibitively expensive and rather difficult. And so how do we encourage younger people to get married without them expressing the excuse, the very common excuse that we hear about financial independence and stability is for us to set up these funds and help them get married. Now, look at this hadith. An Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Holy Prophet has been quoted as saying, أَكْثَرُ أَهْلِ النَّارِ الْعُزَّابِ the majority of those in hell are those who are not married, those that are single. In other words, listen carefully to this. In other words, marriage is the launch pad for proximity towards God. Marriage is a means of seeking nearness to the divine. Marriage is a means of entering paradise and being single is the exact opposite. The majority of those burning in the smoldering inferno of hell are those who choose to remain single. Obviously, if someone is single uh, out of no choice of their own because they're not able to get married, because they're not, uh, for whatever reason, that's, that's another discussion. But if someone chooses to stay single, someone deliberately wants to stay um, in a state where they are not married. In that case, the Holy Prophet says that the majority of those in hell are the unmarried. Now, Imam al-Sadiq says something which we find in the traditions of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, uh, very, very frequently. And it's this idea that there seems to be a connection made between faith and a person's attraction and love of women. We have narrations where the Holy Prophet says that uh, one of the signs of prophets, one of the uh, character traits of God's apostles is that they loved women. We have traditions where the Holy Prophet says, and this is rather famous, he says that I love three things in this world. I love fragrances, atib, and I love women, salat, and the fruit of my eye is prayer. We have other versions of this hadith where the Holy Prophet says, uh, the third item that I love in this world that I've been endowed with is Al-Hasan wal Hussein. Which if you think about it, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa is putting his love towards Imam Al-Hasan and Imam Al-Hussein at the same level as his love for women. Now why this matters and why this is often misunderstood is that you need to take this hadith in context. The fact of the matter is 
that women, as I said earlier in this session, were seen as less than human. They were literally seen in medieval Europe as being half human and half devil. They didn't have the right to own any property. They didn't have the right to buy or sell. They were literally seen as being properties of men, right? And so at a time when this is how the world viewed women, at a time when the Bible, the, the Christian Bible, I recently had a class in uh, our uh, online Hausa program, John the Martyr Academy, uh, particularly uh, analyzing Christianity in general, but in particular, we had one class about women in the Bible. And it's absolutely flabbergasting the kind of demeaning language that we find within the Bible, in particular in the words and letters of Paul, the apostle, so-called Apostle Paul, um, to various towns and cities where his view of women is incredibly demeaning. And so the Bible demeaned women, the prevalent culture of the day demeaned women and saw them as less than human. So then comes the holy prophet of mercy, Rasulullah Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him and upon his immaculate family who says that of all the things in this world, I love fragrances and I love women. The kind of respect and adoration the Prophet is giving to women. Again, at a time when it wasn't just the West or the East, but in Arabia itself, the way women were perceived as being akin to, to, to animals, to flora and fauna, comes the Holy Prophet and says that, no, 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 no. Th these women have to be respected. They are worthy of my love. They are worthy of the uh, pure, unsullied, Emotions of God's most perfect human being, the Holy Messenger, the final prophet. And so taking all of this into context, it, it's absolutely incredible. And so the connection is made, right? One of the interesting things about these hadiths is that there is a correlation that we find being made between one's love for women and the amount of faith that they have. For instance, look at this hadith. An al Sadiq alayhi salam, Al Abdu kulla mazdada lil nisa'i hubban izdada fil imani fadla. Whenever a person loves women more, and again, we're not talking about lust, we're not talking about sort of uh, carnal desire, we're talking about love, about respect and adoration. Al-abdu kulla mazdad, whenever, this, whenever a person's love towards women increases, his faith also increases in proportion to that. Izdada fil imani, fadla. And as I said, there are multiple traditions that basically have the same gist as this one. I merely selected that one for your reference. Now, what's really interesting is that So I want to go back to that verse that I recited in the beginning, uh, try and uh, take a look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here before we uh, revert back to the institution of marriage and how it is seen through the lens of Islamic um, uh, teachings. So the verse says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Essentially, the words are pretty clear if you understand basic Arabic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that among his signs, now we'll try and translate and then go back to the, to the actual words and delve a little bit deeper. Among his signs, meaning the signs of Allah, and khalaqakum is that he created you, min khalaqa lakum, he created for you, min anfusikum, from yourselves, Spouses, partners, so that you could find tranquility in them. And he created between you, he instilled between you love 
and mercy. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Therein lie signs for people who ponder and think. So, let's go back to these words. First of all, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make marriage one of the signs of God's existence, grace, grandeur, power, all of his attributes, one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he created partners for you. Marriage is one of God's signs. That's how sanctified it is, number one. Number two, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ He created for you from yourselves. Meaning that ultimately, while we have a lot of differences, men and women have a lot of differences, not just biologically, but even their worldview, the way they process things, the way they see things, right? خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ Despite all of the differences, despite all of the contradictions even, you need to remember that he created you, they, they created them, Allah created them, your spouses, from yourselves. In other words, we are different, but essentially the same. How are we essentially the same? A lot of our aspirations are the same. A lot of our desires are the same. A lot of our human attributes are the same. We all want to be respected. We all want to be offered uh, a life of honor and peace. In other words, no man or woman can ever claim that I just don't understand my wife. I cannot have a proper conversation with her. Things that we hear all the time, right? You can't say that because most of the things that you want, she wants as well. If you want to be respected, then she wants to be respected. And if all you did was offered her what you wanted back from her, your life would be much better. So we are different, but at our essence, at our very core, we are the same. Min anfusikum. What else? Allah says, Azwajan partners li taskunu ilayha. Taskunu is tranquility. It's to find peace. In other words, this word in this verse, is highlighting the ultimate objective of marriage. Why are we getting married? I think a lot of people are confused about this, by the way. If you ask newlyweds, what's the point? Why are you trying to get married, right? Are you trying to get married because you get tax cuts or because you want to have kids or because you want to, um, you want to pose in front of others? You want to... Uh, take pictures and say that, yeah, I'm married as well. Are you trying to compete with the Joneses? Like what exactly is motivating you to get married? Are you trying to get married because you want extra income to come into the family? So people get married for all sorts of reasons. The Quran says that the reason we made you in pairs and partners is so that you find peace and tranquility within the confines of of the marital home. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّهِ جَعَلَ means Allah has created, He has instilled. Which means that the love, the compassion, the tranquility, the peace that you find within the marital household is divinely inspired. It is given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is another reason why the peace and tranquility that we find within the marriage can never be found outside of marriage. It can never be found within a mere friendship relationship. It can never be found within uh, the framework of, uh, let's say, uh, being a classmate or being a workmate or anything like that. It can only be found when this contract, this, this social and religious contract is made between these two people and they agree to abide by the terms of the contract. 
that we call marriage. As soon as that happens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses this institution. The love that we talked about that God has towards this institution manifests itself in the form of peace, tranquility, and in particular, mawaddah, which means love. The kind of love that is, doesn't contain a reciprocity clause. The kind of love that you give to the other person even if they don't share the same level of love towards you. جَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in this verse that He has inspired between you love and mercy? Why not love and lust? You see, the word ishq in Arabic is often associated with um, marital or sexual love. You often hear this in poetry, you hear it in, um, bump, you see it on bumper stickers, you see it all over the place, right? The, the idea of ishq. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't talk about ishq here. In fact, we have a tradition where Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, uh, says that uh, ishq is, is, is a trait that particular people have who are deprived of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because ishq is, it's akin to lust. It's the kind of mindless love that excludes everything else, including Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So it's not something that we, that we should aspire to or that we um, validate or agree with. Instead, Allah chooses these two particular words, mawadda, which as I said, is the kind of love that is given to another party um, without any expectations of reciprocity, without any expectations. I love you because you are my wife, because you're my, my husband, because you are someone that I have entered into a contract with by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> uh, the Holy Prophet famously says, uh, as well as the Imams alayhim as salam, when you marry someone, you have especially, uh, this, this is directed to, uh, especially towards men, you have taken these women as trusts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, if you mistreat this trust, if you do not uphold your uh, end of the bargain and your uh, responsibilities and obligations towards this trust, it is God that you're dealing with. It's not that person. So don't ever take advantage of her weakness. Don't ever uh, try to step over her rights uh, in order to uh, satisfy your own desires. At the end of the day, you're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, mawadda, unconditional, unconditional meaning it, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have any expectations of reciprocity. Of course, it's conditional. Uh, it, it, never it should never cross any red lines. But you have mawadda, and number two, you have rahmah. Why rahmah? Which means mercy. Because the very foundation of lasting love is mercy. Mercy is the kind of love that a mother has towards her children. A father has towards his uh, children. Rahmah is above and beyond mere sexual love. Rahma is the kind of, it produces many manifestations, one of which is love. And one of its manifestations is that, let's say this marriage uh, ends badly. If you have rahma towards your husband, if you have mercy towards your wife, what's going to happen is that you're not going to oppress them. Even if things don't go well, even if it ends up in a train wreck. Rahmah is what ensures that you do not overstep. Rahmah is when your spouse gets too old to care for themselves or gets sick or disabled or what have you. And you continue to provide for them. You continue to look after them. You provide selfless love as opposed to self-centered love, which is what we find in many marriages today that, are, that aren't grounded 
in God uh, uh, centricity, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He has inspired within you the seeds of love and mercy. And of course, those seeds then have to be nurtured. As part of the process of being married, you nurture them. You try to uh, provide them with the spiritual nutrients that they need so that they could grow bigger and better as you progress through life and go in that journey with your spouse. Look at this other verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِن نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ Once again, emphasizing the idea that we all came from the same soul, from the same essence, right? In the Bible, interestingly enough, there is a verse uh, in which, um, let me see if I can actually find the reference because it is rather interesting. So, yes. Oh, yes. This is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 to 16. So, Corinthians uh, basically means that it was Paul who wrote a letter to the Corinthians, or multiple letters in this case. And he talked about, um, rather interestingly, about the idea that women should cover their hair um, and they should wear a scarf when they pray. Um, and if they don't do that, then they've dishonored God and so forth. But uh, again, it's one of those verses that most Christians have never heard of. But what's interesting is that then it says uh, in verse number seven, um, Paul says that a man ought not to cover his head since he is in the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So basically he's emphasizing this, this notion again that, um, that women are basically created for men. That's the purpose for which they were created. Um, and there's no other reason for them to exist other than to be in that sort of relationship. But what's interesting is, is how he justifies all of this and how he says that look, women were created from men, therefore they answer to men and no, none other. Whereas in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the verse that I was reading, he says, وَمِنْ هُوَ الَّذِي هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ he created you from a single soul. وَجَعَلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا And he made from it its partner, its spouse. لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا So that he can find tranquility in it, meaning in its partner. Once again, this idea that, and I, I think, you know, this is something that's often uh, missed in the, 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 the chaos and the conversation, that ultimately, a marriage is supposed to be a place of tranquility and peace. And the last thing that either the husband or the wife should do is cause that peace to, uh, to, be, uh, to be taken away from the family, to cause the household to be deprived of tranquility. The last thing they should do is anything that disrupts or disturbs the peace and tranquility. And, you know, oftentimes uh, husband and wives, they, they might get into an argument and the best of them are the ones that say, not in front of the kids, let's get into the room and then we'll hash it out over there. But why should there be any reason for them to get into a fight to begin with, right? There should be nothing but respect. There should be nothing but observing the limitations and the, uh, the, the authority of you like that they have so that this ship is able to sail in a peaceful manner and not have to be uh, always constantly in turbulent waters, right? Keep the peace, keep the tranquility, even at your own expense. Now, another point that you can derive from these two verses that I uh, recited 
and this is really important, is that men and women cannot achieve spiritual growth by themselves. Think about this again. Let me repeat it. A man cannot achieve his spiritual potential on his own. And a woman cannot achieve her spiritual potential by herself. They have to do it together. They have to enter into this institution. They have to enter into this contract. They have to choose to live together and to observe the limits of each other's authority so that they can achieve spiritual growth. Because the aim is to satisfy each other and provide the sanctum and safety to be able to grow alongside each other and not just by themselves, right? One last point that I'll mention, which I think is, is important and a great um, sort of prelude into our discussion in the next session, is that Islam recognizes, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe, obviously he created a system and he instilled certain qualities within us where these attractions and these forces and these um, tensions exist. Because of that, if you look at our scriptures, whether it be the Quran or the Hadith Corpus, one of the books, I don't know if you can see it behind me right here, is a book called Jami' Ahadith al-Shia. And it's a compilation of uh, the hadiths, mean, especially fiqhi, juristic type of hadiths, um, that was uh, made under the supervision of the late Grand Ayatollah uh, Sayyid Buru Jirdi. May Allah bless his soul. Now, this particular uh, hadith collection has three volumes, three volumes allocated to the topic of marriage, which is a lot. There's a lot of teachings. I said this uh, yesterday. Um, we will obviously try and, and go over uh, the highlights uh, in, in this particular series, but Islam has a lot to say about this. Unfortunately, sadly, many of us are completely oblivious to the teachings of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt when it comes to the idea and the concept of marriage. Three volumes in Jami'a Hadith al-Shia. Six volumes in another book that you can probably see behind me, I don't know, called Jawahir al-Kalam, which is a juristic uh, discussion of the major uh, uh, topics of uh, Islamic jurisprudence and in that book six volumes are dedicated to uh, to the juristic discussion of marriage, divorce, etc. So a large part of Islamic literature is devoted to this topic. Why? Partly because these desires are embedded deep into us and affect a significant portion of our lives and partly because Islam views this topic to be a major reason for either happiness or misery. When a person is trapped in a miserable marriage, their life becomes miserable to the core. They turn into an empty shell. Or to quote someone I was talking to recently, it's like a bird who has wings and can fly and knows how to fly, but it's as if its legs are chained, making the bird completely immobile and utterly miserable. There's a hadith, in fact, where uh, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, our sixth Imam, says, he says, Which basically translates as, the worst and most powerful enemy to a believer is a bad spouse. The most powerful, the most debilitating, the, mo the most damaging enemy to an individual is a bad spouse, someone who's trying to make them miserable. So, because maintaining a good and happy and fulfilling and spiritual marriage is so important, that's why we have all of these teachings. That's why we have all of these ahadith, which we'll come to talk about inshallah. 
But a word of warning, a disclaimer, that some of these discussions might prove to be uncomfortable for some people. Not uncomfortable because I don't use discretion when it comes to sensitive subjects. No, I will. But they'll prove uncomfortable because they go against conventional wisdom. Because the things that we've been taught about what a marriage is and what gender roles are and so forth, they're being challenged every day by neoliberal philosophies and ideologies. They're in fact being attacked every single day. And so they've become ingrained. It's almost as if we've bought into this lie that this is what a marriage is supposed to be like. You know, the kind of stuff we find on uh, the pages of these so-called influencers and these hijabis and these, you know, fashion models and whatnot. We've, we've bought into the lie that this is the ideal marriage, right? Where the husband and wife dance around each other, right? We think that that is what a marriage is about, when in fact, our divinely appointed leaders have provided something entirely different, something that might uh, be uncomfortable to sort of digest and process because of our ingrained biases, but that will produce nothing but purity, peace, and tranquility if we apply those teachings, inshallah. And I will provide you with as much as I can with practical steps and with real life case studies and scenarios, inshallah, but uh, we will do so starting in the next session. Inshallah, you can join me again uh, tomorrow, hopefully around the same time. We did have some connection issues. If you're watching this on Instagram, and uh, I do apologize for that. And uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, by the way, to everyone who's joined us. Um, yes, I can see lots and lots of messages. And someone saying it's exactly why at the age of 30 I choose not to be married. Um, well, this statement makes absolutely no sense and goes against all of the teachings uh, in the Quran and the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. I'm not, you know, trying to judge you or anything. All I'm saying is that uh, this is definitely not the way to address the problem. Um, there are issues, there are things that we need to address, but uh, avoiding marriage is not one of them because we have very specific traditions from the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt which say that uh, this is my way, this is my tradition, and if you want to follow my way, then you must get married. Yeah, it's difficult. Nobody said it's easy, nobody said it's, uh, uh, it's uh, you know, all uh, rainbows and butterflies as they say. Um, there are challenges, but that's part of the test. That's part of what it means to be a Muslim who submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and goes through these challenges with the help of God. Um, uh, the sister is saying, so single people can't reach their spiritual goals without being married. The answer is uh, almost certainly not. Um, and as I've mentioned, there are many, many traditions from the Holy Prophet and his household, which emphasize that, um, uh, that for you to be able to achieve uh, your spiritual uh, potential, you must get married. Yeah, and part of it is the difficulty of it all. Part of it is how um, challenges have to be faced and um, have to be addressed together as uh, husband and wife. That's all part of the growth process. Otherwise, without it, um, you will always be a sophomore uh, in terms of your spiritual growth and prosperity. Uh, let's see. I think I've missed a lot of the questions earlier, but um, I'll try and take whatever I can, inshallah. Someone's saying, please ignore the trolls. I have not, um, I haven't seen what they've said, which means I've inadvertently ignored all of them, which is good. <laughs> um, a lot of people sending wonderful messages and salams. May Allah bless you all. Um, so somebody is saying that I agree marriage is very hard these days. Um, it is so easy to give up. And yes, you're right. Marriage is difficult. Um, 
But it's always been difficult. I don't think there was any period where marriage was completely hunky-dory and um, trouble-free. It was always something that, um, that required a great deal of effort. But that's life. I mean, which part of life is, is, is easy? At the end of the day, um, life is all about ups and downs. Life is about a prison. It's, 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 it's what it is at its very essence, as the uh, hadith famously says. الدُّنْيَا سِجْنُ الْمُؤْمِنْ وَجَنَّةُ الْكَافِرِ And so, uh, being in a prison, you don't expect a five-star service. Uh, you expect trouble and difficulty. But you try to weather the difficulty. You try to, to go through the challenges as best as you can with your head raised high. Ultimately, it's about fulfilling your own duty as a Muslim. It's about doing the best you can. And pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in the process, trying to create a life for yourself where you are happy and peaceful and tranquil, and so are the people around you, whether it's your spouse or your children, so that you can um, grow uh, yourself and help others grow along with you, because it is a partnership, right? In terms of our spiritual growth, it is absolutely a partnership. Um, and so you have to hold their hand. It's almost like... Um, it's almost like, uh, like, like people who, I, I don't know, is it mi mountain climbers or, or um, I'm trying to think of a sport where each person is completely dependent on the other and their success uh, depends on the other person's success. Um, it, it has to be win-win or lose-lose, right? There's, there's no middle ground. You can't win while the other person loses. Obviously, in marriage, there are cases where...